So good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And uh, it's an honor to have Bruce Rydell here uh, uh, to speak on his uh, new book, JFK's Forgotten Crisis, Tibet, the CIA, and the Sino-Indian War. We were just exchanging stories, and uh, it's always good to start with an um, uh, anecdote, if you can. So Bruce was telling me a story about bringing some visitors into President George W. Bush's office, which reminded me of the famous story of Dave Powers, who had the role, as you know, he was President Kennedy's kind of right-hand man and had the role sometimes of greeting guests before they went into the Oval Office. And one day, the Shah of Iran came in, and Dave Powers was making pleasantries with him and shook his hand and said, I just want you to know, from everything I've heard about you, you're my kind of Shah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, Bruce <clears throat> Rydell is a senior fellow and director of the Brookings Intelligence Project. He joined the Brookings after 30 years working for the CIA, uh, including serving as a senior advisor and a member of the National Security Council staff uh, to Presidents Obama, George W. Bush, Clinton, and President George H. W. Bush. Uh, so we are honored to have you here, and I wholeheartedly uh, endorse the book, which is on sale in our bookstore. Uh, and we'll only be able to touch uh, just briefly, really, on the fascinating story uh, that's told therein, and uh, Mr. Rydell would be happy to sign your copies. Uh, and the book just was published last week. That's right. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. Sure. It's particularly nice because this library played a crucial part in the research uh, behind this book, including the declassification of several critical letters that are very, very important in the story. Uh, and I should uh, recognize that Mr. Rydell's wife and his son, a newly minted PhD from Boston College, is also, are also here with us uh, today. Uh, so I'm going to follow somewhat uh, the script of the book. Uh, and I thought I'd bring a few photos from our archives. Um, and so the first one, and it's how Mr. Rydell opens the book, uh, is this very famous dinner. Uh, that was held uh, at Mount Vernon, I think the only state dinner ever held right. at Mount Vernon. Uh, and maybe you can set the context and explain uh, why the dinner was there and who was the sure. guest of honor. It's July uh, 1961. Uh, the Kennedy administration is off to a rocky start. You've had the uh, Bay of Pigs fiasco. You've had a disastrous summit meeting between President Kennedy and Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna. And the administration really needs to show some competence and some class. Mrs. Kennedy came up with the idea of having a state dinner at Mount Vernon. Uh, she had been very impressed when they went to Europe by Versailles and the Schoenbrunn Palace. Of course, we don't have any palaces in America, but we do have the first president's home on the Potomac. So she arranged to have the dinner there for the dictator and president of Pakistan, Ayub Khan. Ayub Khan is in the picture here. Uh, it's a white tie dinner on a July evening. Uh, they arrived by coming down the Potomac on the presidential and secretary of Navy yacht and then had a fine dinner. The substance of the conversation, though, was about a secret CIA project. Uh, the CIA was providing support to rebels in Tibet fighting communist China at the time. And it was doing that from an air base inside of Pakistan. Well, President Ayub Khan had been very irritated that the President Kennedy had increased economic aid to India significantly in his first six months, and he cut off this secret program. So the head of the CIA, Alan Dulles, persuaded the president to, during the course of the dinner, take a walk in the gardens of Mount Vernon with Ayub Khan and ask him to turn the CIA operation back on. And in fact, he did. And it's very important to the thrust of the story because that CIA operation will be one of the things that probably triggered the Chinese invasion of India in 1962. So you mentioned that, and I put a picture here up of uh, Alan Dulles, that he was in many ways one of the most important people at that dinner. And I know it's hard to cover so much history, but perhaps just a brief description of Alan Dulles and, uh, as leader of the CIA and this question of the CIA as an intelligence, 
intelligence gathering institution or one that oversees covert operations, often overthrowing uh, right. government? Well, Alan Dulles was uh, a legendary figure. Uh, he'd started spying right out of college. Uh, he was a major spy for the United States during the Second World War, actually quite good at it. Uh, and he early on joined the CIA. But what he liked to do was covert action. Uh, he didn't want to do the kind of dull business of analysis and fact finding. He, he left that to others. What he was really interested in was getting things done. Uh, an interesting example of that is uh, Mrs. Kennedy, uh, Jackie, a few years before they became president, had given Alan Dulles a copy of Ian Fleming's James Bond novel from Russia with Love. And he loved it, as the president did. Uh, they all wanted a CIA that could do that 007 kind of stuff. Of course, a lot of those 007 kind of things turn out to be disastrous, and the Bay of Pigs being you know, a very good example of that, put the president on the back foot in the first two months of his administration. And his brother was John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under, um, and I don't know who you probably know, but there was a funny quip uh, that someone referred to them as dull, duller, and Dulles. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, John Foster Dulles was a very strict man, uh, had very fundamentalist views about life. Uh, Alan Dulles was much more, I won't say liberal, but much more cosmopolitan, much more of a ladies' man, uh, really, in many ways, a larger-than-life figure. And he was kept on as director of central intelligence when Kennedy came in because Kennedy had won by a very, very small margin, as you know, uh, and he wanted to demonstrate that he was going to have a bipartisan administration. So one of his first announcements was that Alan Dulles, as head of the CIA, and J. Edgar Hoover, as head of the FBI, would be kept on, both of which were probably, in retrospect, not the wisest of decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll try to set the kind of geographic stage, and uh, you've somewhat done it, but maybe just another word or two about kind of the history of Pakistan and where it was at this moment right before the right. Siren Youth War. But here in the map, you can see uh, China, obviously, to the north, uh, India to the south. You can see the disputed regions between them. Back in 1962, Pakistan was two wings. It was West Pakistan, what is Pakistan today, and East Pakistan, what is today Bangladesh. The CIA operation in Tibet was being flown out of East Pakistan from an air base just outside of Dhaka. One of the great nightmares of the Kennedy administration during the crisis in the fall of 1962 is that the Pakistanis would open a second front and that not only would they be faced with the Chinese invasion of India, but simultaneously a Pakistani invasion of India. Now, Pakistan, by this point, was our most allied ally. We had signed more treaties pledging to the defense of Pakistan than any other country in the world, and yet we had a very conflicted relationship with the Pakistanis because the Pakistanis understood that the Kennedy administration saw as the real strategic prize in South Asia, India country much, much larger with a much more vibrant economy and a democracy like the United States, a country that was naturally ours to support. In 1959, in one of his speeches leading up to the campaign, Kennedy said that the race between red communist China and democratic India was the most important event going on in the world in 1959 because it was a question whether communism or democracy was going to prevail. It was really quite an extraordinary speech. In 1959, I don't think very many people would have said China and India's race is the most important event in the world. But he did say it, and it was ind indicative of how much he thought India was going to be a great future power, and he wanted the United States aligned with that great future power. So just to not assume too much um, historical knowledge of our audience, just give a quick background on China and where China and its leader was at this time. In 1962, communist China was only 15 years old. Uh, it had emerged from a century of civil war and foreign invasions, including World War II. Uh, the Chinese 
governments which in centuries before had regarded themselves as the center of the universe, literally the center of the universe, uh, had fallen into becoming marginal powers in the world, didn't control most of their territory, and for example, didn't control Tibet. Tibet, which they had nominal sovereignty over, had become a more or less autonomous region. Chinese Communist leader Mao Zedong in 1950 invaded Tibet. He did it almost at the same moment as he sent troops into Korea to fight in the Korean War and brought Tibet back inside the Chinese orbit in a quite brutal way in the end. Uh, India, of course, had a great interest in what was going on in its northern neighbor. It was sympathetic to the Tibetan people, but it didn't have any military means to resist Chinese invasion. And Nehru actually wanted to try to make a bond with Mao. And the two of them, in his mind, would have a non-aligned, a third way in the world. Short of it, I think, is to say that Mao played Nehru pretty cleverly for most of the 1950s uh, and more or less ate his lunch. Uh, got to keep Tibet, uh, got to keep claim to these, these border disputes, uh, and Nehru actually introduced him as a nice guy to the rest of the world. Uh, by 1962, this was all falling apart, though, because there was a rebellion going on in Tibet. The communists naturally did not blame their own invasion for the rebellion. Nobody ever invade, blames their own invasion for the rebellion. They blamed outside forces. They knew that the CIA was providing support to the Tibetans, and they assumed that the Indians must be involved in all of that. Now, the Indians probably were witting of what we were doing, but they weren't actually supporting it. The actual support, as I said, was coming from Pakistan. But Nehru found himself being dragged into a conflict with the Chinese. And then, as most elected politicians do in democratic countries, he stuck out his jaw and said, knock me over, uh, and said, we're going to defend every inch of the disputed land. It's ours. It's always been ours. That really wasn't true at all. He took a very aggressive approach with the Chinese. And in October of 1962, the Chinese responded with an invasion. So I'm going to bring us back just uh, slightly. Um, so uh, first, let me, I think I have a, uh, well, let's talk about Ken Galbraith for a moment. So right. JFK's uh, ambassador to India. Uh, Kennedy has surrounded himself with very smart men, uh, most of them with Harvard connections. Uh, and one of the smartest was John Kenneth Galbraith, a man who was very smart, knew it, and thought very highly of himself. Um, very tall. Uh, he was a commanding presence in any room. He wanted to be American ambassador to India, and he became the American ambassador to India. Harvard gave him a two-year uh, approval. If he didn't come back in two years, he would lose his tenure. Uh, he went out there. And because, as we will see in a minute, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Sino-Indian Crisis overlap completely, Washington was focused on the Cuban Missile Crisis, understandably. The apocalypse was at stake. So John Kenneth Galbraith, for the first two or three weeks of the Chinese invasion of India, was basically running American policy on his own. He sent letters back to Kennedy, delivered through the CIA to the White House, got answers back. The rest of the bureaucracy was completely cut out, didn't know what was going on. And Galbraith became the critical player in a very close partnership with, with the president. I hope you don't mind me throwing a quip in here or there. There's two good, one is in your book, uh, which is, uh, when Galbraith was named ambassador, the New York Times wrote an article about him, and he was in speaking to President Kennedy and um, said, well, it was a good article, but, you know, they called me arrogant, and which President Kennedy said, well, I don't know why uh, you're surprised at that. That's what we all call you. Uh, so, uh, and then the, the, uh, the second funny Galbraith story, which is a little off color, I hope you don't mind, is he often was able to communicate directly with President Kennedy. Um, and this was much to the dismay of the State Department because the ambassadors are supposed to communicate through the State Department, not to, but because Galbraith had a relationship with JFK. And Galbraith uh, said that, no, he wanted to talk directly to the president because he said trying to speak to the president through the State Department is like trying to fornicate through a mattress. <laughs> so, um, 
but let's just again go back. Uh, so there's a but there's a, a difference of opinion between Galbraith and Dulles or Richard Bissell, um, Bissell uh, about this covert operation. Maybe just talk a little bit more about this. This is before the war about right. whether U.S. should be supporting this covert operation in Tibet. Galbraith thought that the uh, CIA operation supporting the Tibetans was extremely dangerous, that it could provoke the Chinese. In the end, he, he proved to be right. Uh, he also thought it was uh, impossible. I mean, the Tibetans were not going to overthrow the communist Chinese government. There was no possible way uh, Tibetan guerrillas could defeat the People's Liberation Army of China. Uh, and, in his, and in his very colorful Galbraith way, he also found that the rebels were uh, lacking in hygiene and things like that. And he, he would write these scathing memos back to Kennedy. But Kennedy wanted to put pressure on the communist world. Uh, and the only place we could really put any pressure on communist China was Tibet. One other thing to bear in mind about all of this, the Tibetans were going to fight the Chinese whether the United States helped them or not. And I think Kennedy and Alan Dulles and Richard Bussell, the director of operations, felt that if the Tibetans were going to fight anyway, what harm was it in us trying to help them and try to, we could never even the odds, but at least give them some assistance. Galbraith's protests against this went nowhere. Um, and in the end, after the Chinese invasion of India is over, we then start supporting the Tibetans with the help of the Indians. And Galbraith becomes an enthusiastic supporter of it at that point because now India is in the loop with it, uh, which is an indication that AIDS views on things can change a lot depending upon where they sit and where they stand in the political process. Um, so I just have a couple other photos of the players at the time. So here's the Dalai Lama, uh, who you've somewhat described, you know, was in Tibet, then led Tibet, then went back into Tibet, and then decided to leave again. Right. It comes out with the assistance of the CIA. It was a, it was a significant coup for Alan Dulles. He was able to sell then President Eisenhower. We got the Dalai Lama out of communist China. And then we just have a photo here of Mao. Um, but I thought maybe it might be helpful again just to take a quick step back. So the 1960 election, there's really quite a difference between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy and their view of this part of the world and the whole non-alignment movement. I thought maybe you could Absolutely. talk about that. Absolutely. I mean, Nixon uh, was the ultimate John Foster Dulles acolyte. He believed that there was good and evil uh, and that we should support the white knights and that Pakistan fell into that category because they were 100% supportive of us against the Soviet Union and China. Of course, Pakistan wasn't really 100% supportive of us, but it was happy to take our arms and economic aid to build itself up against India while always preaching anti-communism. Nixon saw India as a fellow traveler of the Soviet Union at, at worst, and at best naive. Now, Kennedy had a very different view. He saw the new emerging non-aligned countries who had just become independent, like India, like Pakistan, like what was soon to sweep across Africa, as a real battlefield in the Cold War in which we had to be more flexible. We had to show that we weren't just strictly anti-communist, that we recognized that the world wasn't black and white, that there were shades of gray. And he thought India was probably the single most important place where that was, that Nehru was not a fellow traveler. He was not naive. He was a great leader who we wanted to have as much as possible on our side. So he, JFK, gets elected, and is, uh, we already showed you the uh, state dinner at Mount Vernon uh, with the president of Pakistan. Uh, but then JFK is looking forward to this meeting with Nehru. And right. there's an official trip for Nehru to come, but it doesn't quite work out the way right. maybe either JFK or Nehru wants. You couldn't use Mount Vernon again. You know, once you can get away with it, but you can't go there twice. So he took Nehru to Newport uh, to see the uh, uh, city where he had, John F. Kennedy had gotten married in uh, and stay at Haversmith's Farms, which was uh, Mrs. Kennedy's family home. Uh, there's a great moment in this trip where they're driving through 
uh, Newport passed all the mansions on their way to Hammersmith Farm. And Kennedy points out to the Prime Minister of India, this is how the average American lives. <laughs> And Nehru says, yes, I've read about your affluent society, which is, of course, Galbraith's most famous book. But that was about as outspoken as Nehru was. At this point, Nehru was quite old. He was quite ill. Uh, and he just didn't have much in him. And for most of the trip, he responded in monosyllabic. He didn't engage. And another, a couple of other things didn't go well. When they actually got back to the White House for the uh, state dinner, uh, someone forgot to open the flue in the East Room, so when they lit the fire, the oh, East sorry. Room filled with smoke. Uh, not a particularly pleasant occasion. Um, Nehru also brought his daughter, Indira Gandhi, uh, go on to become Prime Minister own right, a very famous, a very strong woman. Uh, Jackie and Indira did not hit it off. Uh, Jackie wrote later that Indira was one of the most sour people she'd ever met in her life, that every minute she looked like she was uh, eating a lemon while she was talking to you. Um, but Nehru and Jackie hit it off big time. And it's, I think it's safe to say that Nehru uh, had a crush on the first lady. I think we have a picture of them. This is actually in Newport. You, um, right, this yeah. is on the, on the presidential yacht. Uh, sailing in Newport Harbor with Galbraith and Kennedy and Nehru. Uh, so uh, again, suffice it to say, the, the, the trip was not a huge success, but Galbraith is still trying to find a way to kind of strengthen ties between the United States and India. Right. Uh, and they come up with this notion of having Jacqueline Kennedy take her first solo trip. And maybe you can talk about what went into the thinking about that trip right. and what were the hopes were. They wanted to. Uh, establish a bond, not just between uh, leaders, but between people. Um, and uh, the First Lady uh, had yet to go on a foreign travel by herself. Uh, in fact, First Ladies had not really traveled very much by themselves. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt did a little bit in the war, uh, but uh, neither uh, Mrs. Truman or Mrs. Eisenhower did. Uh, this would also be the first visit abroad by an American first lady in the age of television, where, of course, the audience at home could watch and see what was going on. Uh, Mrs. Kenny was very nervous about this. Uh, she postponed the trip several times. Uh, she said, how can I possibly go alone? Of course, she wasn't going alone. Her sister was going with her. There was a secret service. There were 500 journalists or so. Uh, she pulled it off magnificently. Uh, her charm, her wit, uh, her class uh, made her uh, instantly a huge success, first in India, where she spent, I think, nine days, and then in Pakistan, where she spent an additional four. Uh, the crowds came out for Mrs. Kennedy in 1962, in the spring of 1962, a lot like the crowds came out for the Beatles later on in the 1960s. She was immensely popular, and it did a lot for the Kennedy administration, not only in South Asia, uh, but worldwide by showing you know, we, we really had something to contribute and that the First Lady had something to contribute. And that the United States was not this kind of dull Eisenhower, Dulles, Cold War country. It was really a smashing, new, exciting country with a very exciting and very young. She's only 32 years old when she goes to India in 1962. So, uh, so quick, uh, brief aside, but we had a, a, a showing of a new PBS documentary on Walt Disney. And in my introduction, I mentioned that when Nehru came to the United States, he wanted to go, or he went to um, Disneyland or Disney World, whichever one's in California. And I joked that when Jacqueline Kenny went to India, she visited the Taj Mahal when Nehru came here, he went to the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> uh, but we have a few photos, just because they're so stunning, of uh, Mrs. Kennedy. And there's John Kenneth Galbraith in the back, uh, who was a wonderful host. I think he, you know, and talking about, um, you talked about the flu. Uh, there's a funny story about when she arrives, they can't meet her in the car that they want to right. meet her in because 
his youngest son, the ambassador's youngest son, had locked the keys of the car of the ambassador's limousine inside the car. <laughs> so instead of going in the stretch limo, they ended up going in a, a kind of beaten up old Indian car. Uh, but and they got over that. Again, uh, she gets along famously with Nehru. And uh, here she is, and this is her sister behind her. Um, and uh, that's the still in India. But then, as you said, they go to Pakistan for four days um, and famously ride this camel. You had a quip that she said something after riding the camel. She said later after that, I'm never getting on a camel again in my <laughs> life. I mean, they obviously weren't dressed for the occasion. Uh, and then uh, Ayub Khan surprises her with this gift. Right. Uh, to um, pay her back, in essence, for the Mount Vernon event, uh, Ayub Khan gave her a horse. Uh, I think it was a 10-year-old gelding named Zadar. And there you can see Zadar. And uh, by every account, including her own, uh, Mrs. Kennedy immediately fell in love with this horse. She was a horse person to start with. And this horse just became, uh, for her, uh, the best she'd ever had. Uh, she writes that night back to President Kennedy saying, uh, you're President of the United States. I'm sure you can find some way that this horse can be flown back to the United States without having to go through customs and all those kind of changes and inspections and everything like that. Uh, and of course, as the President, he then had no choice but to find a way to get Sadar back to the United States as quickly as possible. And Sadar will then spend uh, years uh, uh, on the uh, Kennedy's homes. Uh, this is actually in Pakistan. She rides him in Pakistan. And a similar story, her Secret Service agent, Clint Hill, was here. And he said that was the biggest challenge of this trip is what do you do with a horse? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> gives right. one to you. And uh, he was part of. Uh, and then actually, this is her riding the horse, riding uh, Sadar back in their home in Middleburg, Virginia. And a sad coat of the uh, Sadar was in the funeral procession. Not Black Jack, the more famous horse, but uh, Sadar was also. Right. Sadar will be the horse that's uh, riderless behind the caisson uh, at the end of the, when the president is assassinated. OK, so now, um, again, this is, that was the spring of 1962. And then it's in the summer that things begin to heat up. And maybe um, you can talk about kind of Nehru's maybe mistake, uh, but this forward policy and what that was. The Nehru realized belatedly uh, by the summer of 1962 that Mao Zedong was not his friend. Uh, he also increasingly realized that something was going on between Ayub Khan and Mao Zedong, that a new axis was being formed. Uh, but he made a, a critically decision, a bad decision, what he called a forward policy, which was that India would not only adhere to its maximum territorial claim, but it would put forces as forward as possible on the border, which really put the Indian military in an impossible position. This, this is a very difficult border. We're talking about fighting in the, in the Himalayas. Uh, the Chinese uh, had a much larger army much better equipped. Uh, they had just fought in the Korean War uh, against the United States and the United Nations. They were very well led. Uh, the Indians were basically fighting with equipment left over from World War I. And in October of 1962, the Indians uh, are surprised, and the Chinese overwhelm them uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and then maybe, and you talk about it in the book, but what do you conjecture uh, prompted Mao to counterattack or to, right. you know. Well, of course, there is no Mao Zedong Presidential <laughs> Library and Museum in uh, Beijing. Or if there is one, it's, uh, it doesn't specialize in declassifying the documents of his uh, chairmanship. Uh, he, was a, he was a very extraordinarily secretive person. He believed the whole world was against him. Uh, he lived in a secret enclave uh, most of the time. So we don't know. The honest answer is the Chinese part of this puzzle, we don't know. Uh, we don't have any insights into it. Uh, but I think we can conjecture from what the Chinese said officially at the time that Mao Zedong saw a conspiracy against China. And he saw that conspiracy being led by the United States, uh, operationalized by the CIA and that 
uh, the Prime Minister Nehru was part of this conspiracy, and the intent was to try to take Tibet away from China. The forward policy gave Mao the perfect pretext for an invasion. He could say, the Indians are infiltrating our territory. We're going to defend our territory. We're going to make sure that we control this territory. We reunify traditional China. The war takes place in two parts. One is in the extreme far northeast. That part up there is basically a desert. Uh, nobody lives there. But there's a major highway that links Xinjiang province to Tibet that runs through there that the Chinese very much wanted to control. And then the second part is over here in the northeast, um, which is uh, very heavily forested. Uh, this is, of course, famous for tea, found, tea plantations and things like that. Uh, and here, the Indians uh, were very determined to keep the border as far north as possible because you can see this, this little part of India is like a, a, a chicken head that's stuck off from the rest of the body and very, very vulnerable, particularly in the area around what was then the semi-independent state of Sikkim, which is now fully part of India. Uh, but you could cross there and, and basically cut off this whole eastern part of India. So now you call it JFK's forgotten crisis because it's happening almost simultaneously with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And again, as you say, we don't know Mao's intentions or there's, uh, but do, was it planned? Was it, do you have a sense that he would have done it anyway? Or did he see an opportunity with JFK so preoccupied with what was going on? There's no evidence that I found of collusion between Khrushchev and Mao. In fact, if anything, Mao is operating independently now. The, the Sino split has taken place, although the outside world doesn't really know that. So what Kennedy is confronted with in October of 1962 is the two great communist powers each making a very bold and aggressive st step. And it, it kind of all comes together on the 16th of October 1962. Uh, the President's National Security Advisor, McGeorge Bundy, goes into his office that morning and he gets his overnight take of top secret material. And there's two memos. One memo is from the State Department and says, we think China is about ready to invade India. We think China will quickly defeat India and we think India will therefore ask you for assistance. And the second memo is from the Central Intelligence Agency reporting that the U-2 flight over Cuba has revealed that the Soviet Union has put intermediate range ballistic missiles in Cuba with nuclear weapons. You can imagine what that must have been like for both Bundy and the administration. Here they've got these two enormous crises. In fact, in retrospect, we know that the CIA estimates of what the Soviets were up to minimized it. The CIA thought there were 8,000 Soviet combat troops in Cuba. There were 50,000 Soviet combat troops in Cuba. We thought they only had intermediate range nuclear, ballistic, nuclear ballistic missiles. They had tactical nuclear missiles, which were all aimed at Guantanamo Bay. So that if we had invaded Cuba, the Soviet commander in Cuba had the authority to annihilate Guantanamo Bay with a nuclear exchange without even going back to Moscow. Now the, Understandably, historians and uh, movie makers and TV makers have focused on the 1962 Cuban crisis because it really was a question of Armageddon. But from Kennedy's perspective, and it, he said it in his time to his aides, he wondered which crisis would in the long run have more impact on the world. Would the crisis in Cuba which could probably be contained and sealed off, he hoped, be as important as the conflict between the two largest countries in the world, China and India. And at the critical moment in the war between China and India, in November of 1962, on the 19th of November, the Chinese are pouring in. They've overtaken all of that territory. They threatened to take that entire part of India east of 
Bangladesh, and even perhaps come down to the Bay of Bengal and take the city of Calcutta. And Nehru writes a letter to uh, Kennedy, which the uh, John F. Kennedy Library was the first to have declassified a couple of years ago. And he says in the letter, we face catastrophe. Eastern India is at risk of being lost to China. And the Pakistanis look like they're getting ready to attack as well. And he asks Kennedy for 250 American combat aircraft, air crews, and radar teams to be immediately deployed to India to protect Indian airspace while the Indian Air Force starts to bomb inside communist China. Nehru's request is amazing. I mean, he is asking the United States of America, and he was also asking the British, by the way, to not only send him supplies, which we were already doing, but to actually become involved in an air war with communist China in 1962. Um, in, in many ways, Nehru is doubly humiliated. I mean, he's humiliated on the ground, because and Mao is gleeful. But, right. um, but then he has to, you know, Mr. Non-Aligned, you right. know, the leader in the Non-Aligned movement, basically go to the United States and plead for support. And, it, and it's a just terrible moment in Indian history. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's humiliated. Uh, he's defeated. Uh, he's at the risk of losing a substantial part of his country. Uh, he's worried that Pakistan is going to stab the knife in his back. And he comes... I wouldn't say begging, but he comes desperately uh, to Kennedy and asks for American help. Even worse, probably, even more humiliating, he asks the British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, for help as well. I mean, you can imagine, they, he was the man who led India's struggle for independence against the British Empire. And here, just a decade and a half later, he's asking the British for help. But what he's really looking to is the United States for help. Kennedy immediately, at the advisement of John Kenneth Galbraith's orders, an American aircraft carrier battle group to sail into the Bay of Bengal as a sign of American support for India. He triples the size of the airflow. At this point in the war, the United States Air Force is flying hundreds of tons of equipment into India in order to support the Indian Army. He triples that overnight. And he decides, in response to these letters, to send Averill Harriman one of the icons of American diplomatic history. This is the man who FDR sent to London in 1940 during the Battle of Britain and to Moscow in 1941 during the Soviet, the German invasion. He's, you, know, he's, you cannot be bigger than Averill Harriman in American diplomacy in 1962. And he immediately dispatches him on the night of 19 November uh, from Andrews Air Force Base uh, in an airplane to go to India in order to assess and find out what the Indians need. Um, at that point, that critical moment, Mao stops on the 21st of November. Unilateral ceasefire. Now at the time, of course, nobody knew whether this unilateral ceasefire was going to last a night, a fortnight, or as it has turned out, for the next 52 years. At the time, that was unclear. Harriman's mission even when the Chinese announced they were halting, was to find out what the United States would need to do to help India if the Chinese resumed their operations. You get one of the great what ifs of, of history. What if the Chinese hadn't stopped? Or what if they'd stopped for a couple of days and then resumed their advance? What would Kennedy have done? Of course, we don't know the answer to that question. What we do know is that the year later, in 1963, on the advice of Harriman and Galbraith, the United States carried out, with the assistance of the British Royal Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and the Royal Australian Air Force, an air exercise in India, which was exactly what Nehru had requested in that letter in 19 November. In other words, Kennedy decided to at least practice coming to the defense of India in the in the event of a future Chinese invasion. Now, I draw the conclusion from that that if China had not stopped on the 21st of November, the United States probably would have entered this war, and subsequent history of the world would have been dramatically different 
than what it was. So we'll come to your questions in a moment, but um, maybe to round up this part, uh, we haven't talked too much about Pakistan and Ayub Khan and the relationship between the United States and the United uh, Pakistan and the United States as this war is unfolding and right. JFK uh, rushes to India's defense and what that does to our relationship with Pakistan. Well, right away, Ayub Khan begins to say, I've been betrayed. The president has promised me first at Mount Vernon and then uh, when his wife came that uh, I was the favorite of the Americans. Uh, after all, I have all these signed treaties. I have all these CIA operations going on. Uh, I should be his best friend. Why is he coming to the defense of India? And then Khan begins writing letters to the president and saying publicly, I should be compensated. If you're going to help India, I should get something in return. Of course, what does Pakistan want? It wants the rest of Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which had been divided in 1947 and 1948 during the Indian uh, partition. It was Pakistan's raison d'etre, uh, and particularly Ayub Khan as a military dictator, raison d'etre to recover control of Kashmir. Galbraith and Kennedy saw this as extremely dangerous. Not only would they potentially have a war with China, they could have a two-front war. So Kennedy now writes to Ayub Khan and says, no, uh, all of our treaty obligations are with you in the event of war with communism, not war with India. And if you invade India at this moment, we will see that as a hostile act. And it's through this pressure that I think Pakistan is kept neutral at this very critical moment. And you do come to a fairly strong conclusion that, uh, again, we can't know 100% because of Mao's secretive nature, uh, but that he, it really was President Kennedy's response uh, that likely, in your estimation, is what uh, caused Mao to uh, call for the ceasefire and uh, almost withdraw his uh, troops. And in some ways, that mimics JFK's kind of strong response in the Cuban Missile Crisis that has Khrushchev pull back. But if you want to comment on your I, I think that's right. I think the, the, the Chinese saw that the United States was coming to the defense of India in practical terms. American United States Air Force jets were landing in Calcutta, offloading equipment putting it on C-130s, which were flying it to the front line. He probably didn't know about the letter from Nehru, uh, but he could see where this was going. Um, the United States was saying publicly things like, uh, we regard this as, as significant act of aggression as the North Korean invasion of South Korea in 1950, which of course led to the Korean War. Uh, so I think that firmness uh, very much sent the message to the Chinese uh, stop while you're ahead. And that's what essentially they did. They stopped while they were ahead. They kept the part of territory in the far northwest and they retreated from most of the territory in the northeast. Now, of course, the conflict didn't end then. And in fact, this is the longest border dispute in the world. Uh, China and India dispute a longer period, a longer physical border than any two other countries in the world dispute. They've held dozens of meetings since 1962 to try to find an agreement, but there is no agreement. Uh, this is still a disputed border. Uh, and from time to time, there are incidents, usually nonviolent, but not always. Uh, and of course, Pakistan has moved from being uh, kind of a, a suitor of China in 1962 to being a full-scale ally of China today. China and Pakistan just agreed on a $46 billion aid agreement for China to build infrastructure in Pakistan. So in a very, I think a very important way, the contours of modern Asian geopolitics were set back in 1962. And in, in, in an oversimplified way, it's a China-Pakistan axis and a United States-India axis. Now, between 62 and 2015, we've had a lot of fluctuations, but we've essentially ended up in that place. And one last thing to say about its contemporary relevance, uh, this war started an arms race uh, between China and India. 
which quickly in 1964 became a nuclear arms race when China tested its first nuclear weapons, and then became a three-way nuclear arms race when Pakistan tested nuclear weapons. And this is the fastest growing arms race in the world today. And if you want to understand its origins, it's really back in, in 1962. And I think if you look at this crisis, and if you're like me, you admire John F. Kennedy's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I think was his finest hour, and faced with awesome decisions about the survival, not just of the United States, but probably of the human race, he very calmly, very deliberately found a way to end the conflict without war. He was at the same time multitasking on a global level. He was dealing with one crisis in the Caribbean and another in the Himalayas. And when you realize that, this was his finest hour as I don't think anyone has ever portrayed it uh, as comprehensively before. It was really a tour de force of presidential leadership. So before we go to your questions, please join me in thanking Bruce Rydell for this question. Uh, so if you have questions, I'll call on you. And if people can't hear the questions, I'll repeat them. Now we didn't bring up Tibet again. What happened to Tibet at the end of this crisis? So again, let me just say the question is, what happened to Tibet at the end of the crisis? At the end of the crisis, uh, Harriman sets up uh, a bunch of subcommittees. One deals with the question of military aid to India. Another deals with the question of Pakistan. The third deals with the covert operation. Uh, and now Pakistan fades out of the CIA program, and India comes into it much more robustly. Uh, and the Indians start supporting the Tibetan resistance, but with a lot of care. Um, they don't want to provoke another Chinese invasion. Uh, so they build up a Tibetan defense force that basically defends the Indian side of the Chinese-Indian border. And they don't do very much to support the Tibetans inside. And by the mid-1960s, the Tibetan rebellion has fallen apart, collapsed, uh, and the whole operation Basically, the, the US and India say, too hard. Uh, what we'll do is cooperate on other things. For example, uh, U-2 missions are now flying out of Indian air bases secretly over communist China. And the Tibetan operation uh, is all but dead and finally finished off by Richard Nixon, uh, who, of course, despite being the most hardline anti-communist in American history famously goes to China. And as part of that very significant change in American foreign policy, he shuts down all of these CIA operations trying to cause trouble with the communist what Chinese. Tibet and Tibet today is, in the eyes of many Tibetans, especially the Dalai Lama, an occupied country. Um, the Chinese uh, claim, of course, it's always been theirs. Um, you could, you could and, and many people have written very long books arguing about who has sovereignty there. I think it's safe to say that the Tibetan people are a subjugated second-class citizens in their own country. And what the, the Chinese are doing, um, which the Dalai Lama expected back in the 1950s, is encouraging the mass migration of Han Chinese into Tibet and also into Sikyang. So that today, the Tibetan population, the ethnic Tibetan population, is a minority in their own country. A question here. Uh, you said that the um, CIA operations in Tibet were a contributing factor to Chinese aggression. Would you say that's a consensus view, or is that new with your book? And also, the declassified documents that you referred to, when were they declassified? Can I just, because uh, we're recording this and people can't hear in the microphone. So the first question had to do with the covert operation um, and whether that's the consensus view. And the second is a question about how these documents get declassified. I think it is pretty much a consensus view. Um, covert operations are, by definition, covert. Uh, they're supposed to be clandestine secret affairs. Uh, but like most covert operations, this one in time became the subject of several books. 
including, of course, by the CIA officers who were engaged in the operations. It's, uh, uh, that's, that's not a 2015 phenomenon. Ex-spies writing about what they did is, goes back, I think, probably to biblical times. Um, the scholars who I think have studied this most closely come to the conclusion that Chinese motives were multiple and that this was one of the factors in them. Because we don't have access to any Chinese archives. We can't say this was number one and, and the Dalai Lama being in India was number two. But I think from Mao, Tse's, Mao Zedong's perspective, uh, he knew uh, that the CIA was up to what he regarded as no good in Tibet. Uh, and he believed that this was all a product of American collusion with the Indians. And of course, there's the great irony that the war actually produces the outcome that Mao Zedong was allegedly worried about up front, the collusion that I mentioned that comes afterwards. Um, the critical documents, the most critical documents, the two letters Nehru sent on the 19th of November uh, were only declassified, I think, three or four years ago. Uh, historians had known that these letters existed. Uh, the State Department, in its annual release of, of documents uh, 15 years after uh, they've been written, um, noted that there were two letters, but didn't actually include the letters in the documents. On the Indian side, um, of course, as you alluded to, this, this is very humiliating. Uh, and the existence of these letters was denied. Um, Nehru's immediate successor, uh, when asked about this, said, we've thoroughly checked the Indian archives. Uh, we've looked everywhere. And there are no copies of these letters, so these letters don't exist. Uh, but of course, they do exist. Uh, Galbraith, who wrote an absolutely uh, magnificent diary uh, of his time in, in New Delhi, uh, which is just riveting to read uh, because it's very politically incorrect in many places, uh, he alludes in his diary to the two letters uh, in some detail. Uh, but it wasn't until uh, the library here uh, declassified them that the full extent of them was made available. And you can really see, particularly in the second letter, Nehru is a man at the end of his, end of his rope. Uh, he thinks his country is going under. And if he doesn't get American support and get it immediately, and that means American airplanes, American crews being willing to fight Chinese communists uh, in the air, uh, his country is going under. Just a general question about the CIA, as someone who spent their career there, and allow you to answer the critics who would say, shouldn't the CIA be limited to intelligence gathering rather than covert operations? And really, kind of a dastardly history. I mean, I joked early on about the Shah of Iran, but we put the Shah of Iran in or overthrow a legitimate governor of Guatemala. What's your response to those critics? Uh, my response to that would be very simple. Uh, these operations are all approved and in many cases uh, instigated by presidents. Um, I said earlier, John F. Kennedy uh, loved the 007 thing. Uh, he's not alone. Uh, presidents get into office. Um, I'll use the Shah of Iran as a good example. Uh, Eisenhower comes into office and he has a very messy problem in Iran. Uh, the Iranian nationalist government led by Mohammad Mosaddegh is trying to regain control of Iran's natural resources and actually get money out of the sale of oil from Iran. Very revolutionary idea. It was a revolutionary idea at the time. Uh, this was seen in the Cold War paradigm as uh, uh, flirting with the Soviet Union, flirting with fighting uh, the global oil companies. Eisenhower turned to the CIA and said, what can you do about it? And Alan Dulles came up with a plot to overthrow Mosaddegh and restore the Shah. Eisenhower, after the fact, when Alan Dulles had pulled it off, was astounded. He said, this is amazing. You know, I fought uh, Nazi Germany at D-Day, and we lost thousands of Americans. Uh, you restored the Shah of Iran without a single American being killed, not even one being wounded. Uh, and at the cost of uh, 
half a million dollars. There's a natural propensity then for presidents to say, hey, give me the quick, fast, cost-free CIA operation uh, that gets me out of Dodge tonight versus the really hard, let's change our policy or let's invade or something like that. Now, that's not to say that the CIA isn't capable of coming up with Looney Tune operations. Uh, when you create an environment in which the White House is saying, uh, solve the world's problems for us uh, with some uh, clandestine operation, you're going to come up with people who say, well, let's put poison in Castro's beard, or uh, let's see if uh, we can uh, arm the Tibetan rebels to defeat the communist Chinese. Um, and that's where presidents become very important. And uh, presidential leadership, not only in terms of saying yes or no to an operation, but also in picking the right guy to be the director of central intelligence. I think Kennedy's big mistake, I, I alluded to at the beginning, was letting um, Alan Dulles stay on. Uh, Alan Dulles and his director of operations, Richard Brissell, had spent eight years being cowboys in the Eisenhower administration, and they thought they could you know, continue being cowboys. He needed someone who was a little bit more restrained. Ironically, he picked another Republican, John McCone, um, who uh, was a very hardline Cold Warrior, but much, much more skeptical about covert operations. And he replaced Bissell uh, with Richard Helms, a career CIA officer, who believed that covert operations by definition were stupid because they never stayed covert. They always became public. And as Richard Helms told me at one point uh, in his life, he said, they always become public at exactly the most awkward moment for you. So my, I, I promise I'll go to your question, but let me push just once more on this question. Short okay, well, let me just, uh, so say the, the um, the action in Guatemala. So if, using your reasoning, just because we can do it, and we did that one very effectively, one could argue that Guatemala still suffers, you know what I mean, from a, uh, not having a democracy because we overthrow a legitimate government because we were able to do so. And the results of our overthrowing a nationalist, semi-democratic government in Iran in 1953 haunt us to today. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, the, the argument is usually about the Truman administration, which was still in, was still in office in 1950. Uh, then Secretary of, the, the Truman Secretary of State, I think of two months before the Korean War, uh, drew a defensive line in the Pacific. And he said, the United States will defend Japan, the Philippines, Australia, um, Etc. He left out South Korea, <laughs> uh, and probably deliberately, because to be fair, at that point, um, the United States hadn't made a decision it was going to come to South Korea's defense. But I think a lot of historians, and I would agree with this, believe that that error sent a signal to uh, Stalin, Mao, and the North Korean dictator that invading South Korea would be uh, cheap and easy, and they did. And then the United States, the parallel was drawn in 1945 uh, when the Japanese surrendered and you had to decide what part of Korea would the Americans occupy and what part would the Russians. The parallel was drawn by American and Russian negotiators. Yes, John Foster Dulles was very much involved in the in the DAS, in the in the post-war 1945 uh, diplomacy. He was kind of a rising star. I don't. I, I honestly don't know whether he drew the parallel or not. I'm pretty sure that he was directly involved in the Had a question here. Thank you very much. Sure thing. I had a few questions about the timeline of the November 19th letter 
of India for help and the arrival of the, of the Naval Task Force in the Bay of Bengal and the Air Force operations, test operations training versus the time that Mao decided to stop his invasion. Who coordinated that? And did the invasion stop before the arrival of the task force and the Air Force? Right. Um, the airlift of supplies by the United States starts in late October. That's underway as the Chinese are advancing and intensifies as time goes on. On 19 November, Nehru writes this letter asking for American combat aircraft to come. Kennedy immediately dispatches an air, a aircraft carrier battle group. Because the Chinese stop 48 hours later, the aircraft carrier battle group never arrives in the Bay of Bengal. The, the Navy says, the crisis is over, let's withdraw. Uh, there's some confusion in other books about this. Some books say the carrier battle group did arrive. Uh, Navy records are pretty clear. Uh, the carrier was dispatched by Kennedy on the evening of the 19th, but because it's a long sail from uh, South China Sea, where the carrier was deployed, to the Bay of Bengal, it never got there and, and never showed up. The exercise I talk about takes place in the summer of 1963. So, more than six months after the Chinese have stopped. And it's, a, it's a, an air exercise. It's what the US military and other militaries do routinely in a lot of places around the world. But what was unusual about this is we'd never exercised in India before. And we'd never exercised in India in this manner, which was basically uh, what Nehru had been asking for in that letter on the 19th of November. So, Six, eight months after the letter, we actually carry out an exercise which is in response to the spirit of that letter, but in a different atmosphere when the war is not going on. And the other thing that's, I think, quite interesting is we don't do it alone. Most of the aircraft, most of the crews in that exercise in 1963 are American. But there's a substantial number of Brits, Canadians, and Australians. So what Kennedy had done was ensure that if there was another war and the United States came to, try, to India's defense, we weren't going to be there alone. We were going to be there with our allies. So let me ask the final question, which is, uh, there are really two heroes to your book, and you've talked primarily about the first, President Kennedy, but the other is Ambassador Galbraith. And again, just your thoughts about, you know, he was an academic from Harvard, a brilliant writer, and yet in this moment, uh, he, he served the role as diplomat and peacekeeper in an amazing manner. What, what do you think caused your, your final comment about John Kenneth Galbraith? I think Galbraith is, is in, he's, as you say, he's the second hero of this book. Um, with very little oversight from Washington, which he undoubtedly welcomed, but <laughs> with very little oversight from Washington, uh, he not only served as ambassador to Nehru, he became Nehru's advisor during this conflict. Uh, and became the man who Nehru looked on for strength. Now, of course, he had Kennedy behind him, so it was real, real strength. But he did more than just serve as a conduit for messages. His memoirs, as I say, are a delightful book. And uh, despite the fact that he didn't like to be called arrogant, uh, he was arrogant. He also knew it. And he was a lot of self-deprecating humor in the book including basically saying, you know, there's, there's nothing so much fun as a crisis like this when you're on your own. It's kind of like engaging in a night of drinking and fooling around with women with no responsibilities the next morning. These are not the kinds of things that politicians in 2015 <laughs> would put in one of their books, but that's why I highly recommend he, he did other things. He, he published a series of short stories while he was ambassador using a pseudonym, which ridiculed the state, I don't mean ridiculed, devastated the State Department and its kind of mindless bureaucracy, and he got away with it because he was the president's friend, and after two years, 
he was going back to Harvard, and that's what he ended up doing. How tall a man was, was Galbraith? I think he was six foot five. Six eight. Six eight. Uh, so the book is on sale, and uh, we'll just do the book signing here. So if you want to go into the bookstore and then bring your books back here, Mr. Rydell would be happy to sign. So we thank you again. For thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. My pleasure.